And I'm excited about our study in the book of 2 Corinthians. We begun this two weeks ago and we continue today in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 1. And here this morning, Paul is going to have to explain why he does ministry the way he does and why it is that he had not visited the Corinthian church recently. He had planned to visit them and then his plans had changed. And this morning, Paul is going to have to explain himself to a church where people were greatly criticizing him. They were criticizing him because they said that Paul had not kept his word to them. He had promised to do something, and then he didn't do it, at least when he said he would. And the plans had changed, and things hadn't worked out exactly as the Corinthian church wanted. And there were people who were saying, Paul's a liar, he's not trustworthy. He's not kept his word to us, and they begin to really question Paul's integrity in his calling as a apostle and a pastor. And so Paul, you must remember, had planted the church in Corinth. He was the founding pastor of the church and served there a year and a half before moving on and planting churches in other cities. We read about that together as a church in the book of Acts chapter 18, and And we have seen how now in the second letter to the Corinthians, which is probably actually the fourth letter he wrote, but the second letter that we have in our New Testament, Paul has been back and forth conversing with and has visited this congregation uh, again in the past. And there is all manner of false doctrine and all manner of challenges there. And Paul in this letter, 2 Corinthians, is going to have to largely explain himself and defend himself. Now, it's never a comfortable place to be to have to defend yourself, but sometimes it is necessary because of the weight of the accusations that have been brought against the Apostle Paul. And what we will see is, is Paul is really innocent of these charges. Paul has been faithful, and Paul has kept his word, and Paul has not lied to them, but they have accused him so. And this morning, I think what we're going to see from the Apostle Paul as he responds to these accusations is how we all have to love difficult people. That we all have to, at times, deal with people who are contrary, uh, people who uh, are argumentative, people who are looking to tear us down and criticize us and others. Now, as you looked at the title of the sermon this morning, How to Love Difficult People, some of you might have thought this would be a sermon on marriage. And I guess it could apply there. I could see how you could get confused. But, but this is in general, how do I love difficult people, especially when they make it so hard to love them, right? We all know people like this. This is something we all have to deal with. And the Apostle Paul is going to show us this morning how to love a difficult person, whether you're married to them or they're your child or friend or parent, brother, sister, whatever. This is how you love a difficult person. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 12, For our boast is this, the testimony of our conscience, that we behaved in the world with simplicity and godly sincerity, not by earthly wisdom, but by the grace of God, and supremely so toward you. Notice here in verse 12 that Paul says, this is my boast. This is what I am going for. This is my goal. This is what what I want to boast about. The testimony of our conscience. That is to say that I have fulfilled my calling. I have done what is right. I've done what God has called me to do. And I know that I've done it to the best of my ability with honesty and sincerity and integrity, and at the end of the day, I need a clean and clear conscience before God. The testimony of my conscience, Paul says, is that I've been faithful. I have truly given it my all. I've done my best, Corinthians. I have been faithful. And sometimes at the end of the day, when when all you hear is negativity and you live in a world where we are professional complainers and criticizers, just look on any social media comment section. Amen, somebody? 
Just, just look out there in this world and, and see it's, oh, the, the, the forecaster got it wrong and those idiots on the news channel, why, why didn't they really cover what the story was about? And, oh, I hate that grocery store. Uh, you know, the lettuce is always brown in the produce section and blah, 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 blah. We complain all the time. And it enters into our lives. Brothers and sisters, one of the things I want to say today is this. There are people like that in this world, and sometimes we can become those people. We have to guard our hearts against this. So as we look at how to love difficult people, I also want you to think, not only do I have people like this in my life that I need to love the way the Apostle Paul loved the Corinthians, but am I sometimes the difficult person who's hard for somebody else to love? As we look at this, Paul says, I have a a clear conscience. The testimony of my conscience is... I've done what is right. And at the end of the day, sometimes that's all you have. Now, how does he have a clear conscience? He says, because we behaved in this world with simplicity (coughs) and godly sincerity. One of the things that the Apostle Paul dealt with was the fact that the Corinthians who were living in a Greek city had imbibed the Greek culture of rhetorism, that is the idea that, that, that... a speaker, a public speaker, a preacher in this case, or anyone who would speak publicly had to be really flamboyant and eloquent. Um, Imagine the Greek speakers as kind of an overzealous Shakespearean actor who's just so dramatic with his gestures and his voice was high and low. And, you know, the Greek speakers really overdid it. They put so much emotion into public speaking you were almost watching a professional actor. And so Paul says, I don't want to be like them. With simplicity and godly sincerity, I just want to proclaim the truth to you. Not that Paul didn't have passion when he spoke, but he wasn't faking it. He wasn't overdoing it. He wasn't acting when he preached. He was laying open and bare his heart and the Word of God and applying the Word of God to the people of God. That's what preaching is supposed to look like. And Paul says, not only in my preaching, but in my ministry and everything I do, I have behaved with simplicity and godly sincerity. Just be honest, be open, be who you are. Don't try to be fake. Don't try to be something that you're not to please someone who probably can't be pleased anyways Please God, serve Him, do things the way He would have you do them, whether it's in your marriage or raising your children or in the workplace or whatever it is. Do it in a way that is sincere and simple and simply trying to obey God and get His approval. Paul says, that's how I ministered the Gospel to you, Corinthians. Not by earthly wisdom. Not the way that men would have me do it. Not the, I, I didn't listen to the criticism of the world around me. I didn't follow earthly wisdom. I followed biblical truth. I didn't do it by earthly wisdom, but by the grace of God. I trusted in God and in His Word and, and in the Spirit supplying all that I needed and opening hearts and minds as I ministered the Gospel. And he said, and I did this supremely so toward you. Paul says, when I came to Corinth, I was careful not to do what the Corinthian culture wanted me to do, which was to be loud and flamboyant and and a really charismatic preacher who would just win people over with with these speaking abilities and eloquence and, and acting as it were. Paul says, I didn't do that. I just shared Christ with you humbly, plainly, sincerely. And I made a point to do it that way because the gospel I preach is not fake. It's not put on. It's not an act. It's the truth of God. That's why I did it that way. And maybe Paul says you didn't like the way I preached, but that's the way I ought to preach. And so maybe that's not how the world says Paul ought to preach the gospel, but that's how God says Paul ought to preach the gospel. Maybe the world says that's not how you ought to live your life, But that's how God says you ought to live your life. Paul says, I'm going to do what God has told me to do. And if the world says otherwise, I'm not going to listen. I'm going to obey God. He says in verse 13, 
For we are not writing to you anything other than what you read and understand, and I hope you will fully understand. Paul says, listen, in my previous letter, probably not referring to 1 Corinthians, but a letter that he wrote between those two letters, he says, I'm not writing anything different. In other words, I didn't tell you one thing then and then change and tell you a different thing now. Because that was the accusation against Paul. You don't keep your word. You say one thing, then you say something else. You're inconsistent. And Paul says, that's not the case. I'm writing to you the same thing now that I wrote to you then. And I hope you will fully understand. Paul, Paul realizes that sometimes in human communication, we don't fully understand one another. You ever have that happen? You ever send somebody a text message or something and, and you meant it one way and they take it the totally opposite way? You know, and you're like, no, no, I didn't mean that. The other day, somebody asked me to do them a favor and, and I texted back, I can do that for you. And Siri thought she would change it to, I can't do that for you. And I thought, wow, that one letter really changed the meaning. And then I, and he's like, why not? And I was like, no, I can. I, well, why'd you say you can't? Well, Siri said that. What are you talking about? Well, it, it was auto. I didn't mean it that way. And we worked it out. But the point is, sometimes speaking or through written communication, things can get jumbled up. Even when the, even when the text comes out the way you intended it to, it can be read differently. And that's what had happened in Paul's letter. And Paul says, I hope you fully understand what I'm saying. There's also a spiritual perception that needed to happen here. The Corinthians, truthfully, were just not spiritually mature enough to understand all that Paul was teaching them and saying to them. Sometimes they didn't get the real reasons behind why Paul did what he did and said what he did, and they didn't understand what was being taught because they were spiritually immature. So Paul says, I hope you will fully understand what I'm saying. He says in verse 14, just as you did partially understand us. Paul says, in the previous letter I wrote, I'm going to be honest with you, you, you didn't really get what I was saying. You, you kind of did, partially, but you didn't really understand. And here, here's the real point that I was making, Paul says, that on the day of our Lord Jesus, you will boast of us just as we will boast of you. Now this is beautiful. Don't miss what Paul's saying here. He's saying when Jesus comes back, all this bitterness and arguing and criticism is going to vanish. Corinthians, when Jesus comes back, you will boast of me just like I have been boasting of you. When Jesus comes back, Corinthians, you're going to stop this. Because Jesus is going to change your heart. And one of the things that's going to happen after Jesus comes back is He's going to perfect our heart and stop us from sinning. And when we stop sinning, one of the things we're going to stop doing is tearing down one another and constantly complaining and criticizing. And Paul says, on that day when Jesus comes back, you're going to boast of me just like I boast of you. Praise God, one day the comment sections on Facebook and Twitter and whatnot will be silent. There will be no more bickering and arguing. When Jesus comes back, He's going to give the final word and we're going to stop being so petty and juvenile. And Paul says, Corinthians, understand, we're going to live forever together in heaven. We better learn to get along now. Because heaven's going to be miserable if we keep on like this. And the good news is when Jesus comes back, He's going to change our hearts and this is going to stop. He said, I want you to understand that. And maybe that will motivate you to go ahead and get ready for that day when Jesus comes back. And just go ahead and stop now. And let's work together for the gospel and, and not fight with one another. Boy, don't you wish people in your family would get that message. In your workplace would get that message. Friends would get that message. Children, parents would get that message. Your brother, your sister. You know, we're going to have to spend eternity together. We better learn to get along. Why don't we just start now? Maybe I just need to forget what you did to me or what they said back then, and maybe I just need to love you now because it's hard to love a difficult person, and sometimes I am that difficult person. It's a lack of humility not to admit that you've been that difficult person, by the way. If you think you've never been that difficult person, it's probably because you're not really being honest with yourself. I think we've all been that person. 
Some of us have been that person more often than others, but have we not all been that person? And, and so then can we not treat others with humility when they treat us that way and we say, you know, I did that to somebody one time and I was wrong when I did it. They're wrong now when they're doing it to me, but since I've been on that end, since the shoe is now on the other foot, maybe I'll have a little grace knowing that somebody years ago had grace on me. Not only that person, but the Lord Jesus Christ. When he forgave me for being that difficult person. Paul and Barnabas had an argument and they split and went separate ways. And God taught Paul and Barnabas a whole lot through that experience. Paul, Paul had been that difficult person before. I mean, my goodness, read Acts 7 and 8 when Paul is standing there approving of Stephen being stoned to death. I think Paul and the fact that he rounded up Christians to have them executed was a, a bit difficult at times. Paul had been that person and he learned to confess that he was wrong and repent and change. And we need to do the same. Every one of us. This message is not directed at any individual or any circumstance. It understands that we all go through this. That every one of you right now is thinking of people in your lives, in relationship, in your home, in your family, in your workplace, your marriage, your, your, your children, whatever. You're, you're thinking of relationships right now like this and you're thinking, gosh, is he preaching at me? No, I'm preaching at me and all of us together because we all go through this. And that's why we can learn so much from the Apostle Paul here. So now I want you to look at how Paul deals with the accusation starting in verse 15. Because Paul does have to explain himself. And sometimes with difficult people, you will have to defend yourself. It's not fun to get on the defensive, but sometimes you need to explain why you did what you did. And you just need to lay it all out there. And so that's what Paul does. Verse 15, because I was sure of this. I wanted to come to you first. Remember, Paul hadn't visited them on a previous journey through their area. And he said, I wanted to stop and visit with you. I'm sure of this. I wanted to come to you first so that you might have a second experience of grace. I, I wanted to stop and visit with you and have another visit. He's going to tell us in a moment why he didn't make that stop. But before we get there, I just want to say something about Verse 15 here, some people have read into this phrase second experience of grace that Paul somehow is talking here about some kind of ecstatic experience of being baptized in the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues. I just want to point out that that has nothing to do with the context. The second experience of grace Paul is talking about is his desire to go back to the Corinthian church and visit them a second time and to minister to them that they would have a second experience of the grace of having the opportunity to study God's Word together, to worship together, to minister together. This has nothing to do with anything outside of that. And, and some people build entire doctrines on a phrase and they rip it completely out of context. And I just want to say, when people start talking about the second experience of grace, they say, oh, so you're going to go visit somebody. That's wonderful. Because that's what this phrase is talking about. It's the only place it's used anywhere in the entire Bible. So the entire doctrines that are built upon that verse by some are just, well, it's, it's built upon sand. It simply is not teaching that. But anyways, Paul says here, I, I wanted to visit you again. He says in verse 16, I wanted to visit you on my way back from Macedonia to come back to you uh, and, and uh, to visit you on my way, from, uh, way to Macedonia and to come back to you from Macedonia and have you send me on my way to Judea. What he's saying is, is I was, he was going to pass through going west to east and so as he passed through, he said, I, I want to stop, visit you, then on my way back the other way, I wanted to visit you again. But on the first planned stop in Corinth to visit them, Paul kept going. So he says in verse 17, Was I vacillating when I wanted to do this? Paul says, Do I, do I go back and forth from one thing to another and can't make up my mind? Is, is that what I was doing? Because Paul says, Apparently some of you have, have criticized me and accused me of being a vacillating person who... Who, who can't make up my mind. I say I'm going to come, and I don't, and then I do. And, and, and <coughs> Paul says, is that what I was doing? 
Do I make my plans according to the flesh? Now when Paul says, do I make my plans according to the flesh, of course he's saying, I don't. And what he's implying is there's a spiritual reason for why I didn't stop there as I was passing through last time. There's a reason. Paul's going to get to the reason in a moment. But he's saying, I had a reason for why I did what I did. Do I make my plans according to the flesh, ready to say yes, yes? The, the, the double yes is to say absolutely yes. It's emphatic. Yes, I, I, will, I will stop and visit with you. So do I say yes, yes, and then no, no? Do I say absolutely yes, and then turn around and say absolutely no? Is that the kind of person I am? At the same time, verse 18, as surely as God is faithful, our word to you has not been yes and no. Paul says, I've not lied to you. I've not misled you. I'm not going back and forth and can't make up my mind. That's not what's happening here. Verse 19, for the Son of God, Jesus Christ, whom we proclaimed among you, Silvanus, Timothy, and I, they had all been traveling together, visiting churches, preaching the gospel. He says, the Son of God was not yes and no, but in Him it is always yes. And here's what Paul is saying. The reason I didn't stop the ultimate spiritual reason Paul is going to give, because if I stopped and visited you on this trip, it would be too difficult and cause too much pain and too much sorrow and too much trouble. In other words, sometimes with difficult people, you need a break. You need to step back. You need to let things cool off and then later go and talk with them and work things out. And Paul says, that's what I was doing. I realized that I was going to come and visit later, but for now... While everybody's upset and angry, we just need to chill out, take a break. Then a few months later, we'll get together and we'll work it out. But Paul says, in the meantime, understand this. With Jesus Christ, the answer is always yes. Here's his point. Corinthians, I'm not living for your approval. I'm living for Christ's approval. And ultimately, the reason I do what I do is because I'm trying to obey Jesus, not you. Paul's saying to the Corinthians, you are not the arbiter of what I ought to do in my ministry. You are not the one who tells me how I ought to do this. God is. And brothers and sisters, this will be tremendously liberating in your own life if you can get this spiritual principle. You are to live for Christ's approval, not man's approval. If you know that you are doing what God has called you to do, if you are living according to God's Word, it does not matter what other people say. Now, I'm not saying you, for you to be a cold, callous person who says, I don't care what they think, I only care what God thinks. I'm not saying be a jerk. I'm not saying be callous. What I'm saying is, is don't constantly worry, well, what do they think of me? Do they approve of me? Do they like me? Are they talking about me? But say... What does God want me to do? What does God's Word say? Is Jesus pleased with me? Am I living for His approval? How I wish our young people would understand this. Young men and young women who are obviously constantly craving approval from this world causes young men to show off and do some of the dumbest things. Were some of you guys a teenage boy at once? You know what this was like? I mean, we do anything to try to get people's attention and make somebody laugh or impress the girls. How I wish young women would understand that their beauty is not in their outward appearance, but in their heart, in their character. And what this world tells them is beautiful is, is, is actually just immodest and wrong and cheapens the value of women. How I wish we would understand that we need to live for Christ's approval and not this world's approval that we're serving Jesus and not others? I mean, do we serve Jesus by serving others? Yes. But the ultimate one that we're serving is not some other person, but the Lord. And that's Paul's point here. He says in Jesus, the answer is always yes. In other words, I do what Jesus tells me to do. I'm following His commands. That's my reason, ultimately. I'm trying to obey Christ. Verse 20. For all the promises of God find their yes in 
Him. All the truths of God's Word come from Jesus. All the promises of God are based and rooted and grounded and find their yes in Jesus. So ultimately, I have to think about Him and what He wants and how I should live in light of His Word. So he says, that is why it is through Him that we utter our amen to God for His glory. To say amen is to say, yes, it is true, that is right. And he says, it is through Jesus that we utter our amen to God for His glory. The one we agree with, the one we affirm, the one who we say that what He's saying is true is ultimately Christ. And we do this for His glory. So once again, Paul's making the point that, that ultimately I need to affirm what God's Word says, not what men say. Verse 21, And it is God who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us. Paul says, God made me a minister of the Gospel. Corinthians, not you. God is the one who called me to do this, not you. Brothers and sisters, God has called each one of us to certain tasks in our life. Not your friends, your family members, but Jesus Christ. They didn't call you to that ministry. Jesus did. So labor for Jesus' approval, not theirs. You have to understand that, that the one who calls you to a task is the Lord and not men. Once again, this doesn't mean that Paul doesn't care what the Corinthians think or say. But at the end of the day, if the Corinthians disagree with what God's Word says, Paul has to obey God and not men. He has to do things God's way. And if the Corinthians get upset with him for that, Paul says, I can't change that. I can't help that. He says... It is God who establishes us with you in Christ. God called me to go and plant the church in Corinth. God called me to pastor that church. God called me to go and plant other churches, not, not the Corinthians. And He is the one who has anointed us and set us apart and gifted us for this thing. Verse 22, And He is the one who has also put His seal on us and given us His Spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. Paul says that when a person is saved, they receive the Holy Spirit as a seal upon the heart and a guarantee of the future inheritance. This is to say that when a person is saved, they cannot lose that salvation because the Holy Spirit will keep them and protect them and has sealed them for eternity. And that also means that for the rest of their life, they are going to be living under the guidance and influence and teaching and direction of the Holy Spirit. And what Paul is saying is, is God is leading me in the decisions I've been making, Corinthians, I have tried to be, be obedient to the Holy Spirit. That's why I do what I do. Verse 23. Now Paul just lays it all out on the line. And he says, I know that maybe some of you Corinthians don't believe what I'm saying. You ever try to explain yourself to a difficult person and they accuse you of lying even more and well, this is why you really did that, and you're not an honest person, and you remember that time you did this or that? You know, that's what Paul's anticipating. Because Paul's argued with people like that before, just like you and I have. And so Paul just lays it all out on the line in verse 23, and he says, but I call God to witness against me. Paul says, if I'm not telling the truth, may God show it. I call God to witness against me. Paul's serious here. He said, I'm telling you the truth. I'm not lying. It was to spare you that I refrained from coming again to Corinth. You know why I didn't stop on my last journey through and visit with you? It was to spare you. Because if I had come in that moment when everyone was so upset, it would have made things worse. And Paul is saying sometimes we just need a break and we need to cool off and later we'll deal with those problems. And so we see a principle here that it's okay to do that sometimes. Sometimes you need to do that. Now, do you write that person off forever and never go back and talk to them? No. No, you don't do that. Paul is going to go see the Corinthians again. But he's saying for a time we needed to hit the pause button and think about things before we get together again and say and do things that are going to further damage 
our relationship with one another. So Paul says, verse 24, this is not that we lord it over your faith. Paul says, I'm not abusing my spiritual authority as a pastor and apostle here. I don't lord it over your faith, but we work with you for your joy, for you stand firm in your faith. Paul says, you know what my goal is? To build up your faith. To cause you to trust Christ more and understand His Word more. And if you would have a greater faith and a greater dependence upon God and a greater understanding of His Word, then all of these other problems would be solved. Brothers and sisters, what Paul is really getting at here is is that these problems at their heart are spiritual problems. You know the reason why people are angry and upset and disagree and argue and fight? is because something's not right in their heart. And mere words and more arguing is not going to change the heart. In fact, that often is going to make it worse. What we need is for God to change our heart. What we need is a greater faith and a greater dependence upon God so that we will be humbled, so that we will stop being so stubborn and obstinate, and we will see that, my goodness, yes, they're difficult, I'm difficult, and we all need God's grace. And we're going to put the past in the past. And we're going to obey God and live for His approval and obey His Word and stop bickering and arguing. And Paul says, that's what I want. Paul says, I want to restore my relationship with you, Corinthian church. And the only way to do that is for us to have a greater faith and to look at things biblically and for God to change our hearts. So chapter 2, verses 1 to 4, he finishes out this section. He says, so, so here's, here's the deal. For I made up my mind not to make another painful visit to you. I decided that for now I I couldn't come back. It was too painful. Verse 2, For if I cause you pain, who is there to make me glad but the one whom I have pained? If I come back and it makes things worse, you know the only way that that could be relieved? is for you to make me glad. For for you and I to reconcile, for us to to put this in the past and and work through it and past it and beyond it. Who Who can fix that problem except you, Corinthians, and I if we would forgive one another and work on together? In other words, somebody's not going to come in from the outside and work this out for us. We're going to have to work it out together. Look, that person in your life that you have had trouble getting along with and you just can't work it out, listen, you are going to have to forgive them and they're going to have to forgive you. And if both of you are too stubborn to do that, it'll never work. Nobody's going to magically come in and solve the problem. These kind of spiritual problems are only solved by spiritual solutions which are found in the Gospel of Christ. And Paul's saying, so we need to wait a little longer because that's what needs to happen. We need to forgive one another and move forward. Verse 3. And I wrote as I did, so that when I come, I might not suffer pain from those who should have made me rejoice. I felt sure of all of you that my joy would be the joy of you all. I've heard parents say before that one of the most painful things is when when their child hurts them. Because you should be proud of your child and you should should be able to see your child doing great things for the glory of God and and be proud. And when they mess up and do things wrong, it it not only hurts them, but it, it hurts mom and dad. Paul feels that way as a pastor. He's saying, when I see you stumble and fall, it hurts me. And I want to be proud of you, Paul says. I mean, I want to say, look at the Corinthians. Look how strong they are. Look how they're serving Christ. Look how healthy that church is. I'm so proud of them. Paul says, I can't say that. And it burdens my heart because I want to say that. But it's not true right now. He said, I felt sure of all of you that my joy would be the joy of you all. What he's saying is, is some in the Corinthian church don't want me to come visit right now. And some of them are so bitter toward me that if I came back, it would make things worse. And Paul says, I want to be able to come and visit and preach in that church and be accepted and we can all rejoice together in God's Word. And so until we can work that out, it's it's best that I not come right now. Verse 4, 
For I wrote to you out of much affliction and anguish of heart and with many tears, not to cause you pain, but to let you know the abundant love that I have for you. The last principle on how to love difficult people is this. Don't stop loving difficult people. And tell them that you love them and really sincerely mean it. Paul says, I can't come right now because, because it, would be, it would cause more harm than good. It would be too hard. But I want you to know, I've been praying for you. I've been pouring out my heart to God. There has been anguish of heart and tears shed over this. And Paul says, I want you to know how much I care about you. Sometimes one of the hardest things to do with a difficult person is tell them that you love them and care about them because that causes you to be vulnerable and weak. And sometimes you just want to be stubborn, right? And prove that you're right and they're wrong. Paul doesn't do that. Paul says, I have been crying over this. Now for a grown man to admit that he had been crying about something like this, I mean, that takes a lot of humility, right? And Paul says, I want you to know the abundant love that I have for you. Husbands and wives, isn't it, isn't it true that when we argue with one another, we just want to prove that we're right and the other one's wrong? And if either one of us would just stop for a moment and say, you know what, I don't care if I'm right. I love you and I don't, I don't want to fight. I want to solve this problem and move on because our relationship is so much more important than who left the bag of potato chips open and caused them to be stale, right? Like, they're just, there's bigger things in life and I don't want to argue about the potato chips right now. They're stale, throw them in the trash and let's move forward. And I guess I did it, I don't even know who did it, right? I just wanted to blame you because I'm not about to take the blame for it, but you know. And we do stuff like that. And Paul's saying at the end of the day, we just need to, to confess that what's most important is that we care about one another, that we love one another, and we're going to work through it because that relationship is important. Now, if both sides would agree to do that, we'd work it out. So Paul here is saying, this is how we're going to work it out. We're going to agree that we care about one another, that we love one another, that, 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 that the other person is not terrible, bad, and evil, and not always wrong. And yes, some wrong things have been done and said, but we can forgive and let it go. After all, God forgave me for all the things that I've done. After all, Jesus had to die on the cross, have nails driven through His hands and feet, suffer, bleed, and die for what I have done, so maybe I can forgive you for hurting me because I hurt Jesus a whole lot more than you hurt me. At the end of the day, the only way we can forgive, the only way we can work things out with difficult people is ourselves to stop being difficult people and then to forgive them, not expect perfection out of them, to remember we're serving Christ and not them or anyone else, and to know that ultimately if we are doing things the way God wants us to do and we have a clear conscience, then that's enough. And we are ready to forgive and move forward and reconcile relationships as soon as both parties are ready to do that. And in the meantime, even if they're not, we can have a clear conscience before God and say, I know I'm obeying Christ and doing what's right. And right now for me, that's enough. That's how you love difficult people. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. God, what a needed message that we all need all the time in so many ways with so many relationships. God, forgive me and each one of us for times when we've been that difficult person. God, help us to reconcile relationships. And Lord, help us to be humble and remember that we have hurt Jesus far more than anyone has ever hurt us. And he forgave us and He still loves us. And so we can do the same for others. God, I pray that we would have clear consciences to serve Christ faithfully. Lord, forgive us for our sins. There's one here today who needs to ask forgiveness or reconcile a relationship. God, I pray that your spirit would just speak to their heart but they need to do that now, as soon as possible. And God, if there's one here today who has never confessed their sin to Christ and received His grace and forgiveness, I pray that today would be the day of their salvation, that Your Spirit would grant them faith, open their eyes, that they would turn to Christ, repent of their sins, believe in Him, and so be saved. Lord, we ask all these things in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen.